Traders, welcome back to the most advanced and last masterclass series you'll ever need to watch. This is the second episode, a part of our 30 part series. And today we're talking about a charting system. So if you want really reliable as well as consistent charting, you need to watch this video. Absolutely need to. Like on screen here, you will see a variety of different concepts. But the thing is, I chart these on every stock and they help me to outline the markets. I am never shocked. I'm never surprised because I'm so good at mapping. Charting is also mapping and if you have good maps, you'll never get lost. So I'm going to show you how I chart professionally. You will never see this anywhere else, which is why I'm making this masterclass series. All I ask for is your attention and that you take notes so that you don't waste your own time. And so with that being said, let me show you my charting system from step one all the way to the last step. The first step and arguably the most important step of my charting system is actually drawing this gray line right here, the expected range. Now, what is this? Why is it important? I'm going to explain all of that. But most importantly, first, I'm going to show you how you get this number. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to your broker. And I have Thinkorswim here. And if you don't have it on your broker, you might have to look up a video if you don't have Thinkorswim and find it. But what you're going to do is you're going to go to the stock you're looking at. In this case, this is SPY. And I'm going to go to the options chain. And you'll know all of the expirations here. You guys know all that stuff. But what you'll do is look over to the right. You'll see a plus or minus number. You've been skipping over this number so long and you haven't even noticed. But this number tells you the expected range where you can expect the stock to close between by a certain date. Now, hopefully I don't have to tell you why that's so important. But April 5th, you can see right now on SPY, it says 6.32 approximately. So you would take that number 6.32 and you would add it and subtract it from the current price. And that is where you can expect the market, the SPY, to close in between by that date. This number is well over 70% accurate as far as estimating where the stock will close in between. And that gives you a sense of reality, a sense of focus, where you can be looking in between by a certain date instead of wasting your time making, you know, betting on trades to go down here or here when the odds of that happening are so low. Now, I said this is the most advanced masterclass, so let me explain the science behind that. The expected ranges, this number, comes from the market maker. Why? Because they have to price the options accordingly. Stocks with humongous expected ranges price their options really expensive. The market maker has to have an estimate. He has to have a good idea of how much a stock can move by a certain date to accurately price his options. If he doesn't, he can lose a lot of money. And that is the beauty of this number, is it's driven by the markets, by the market makers. I'd rather trust them then go off some, you know, technical analysis I saw on Twitter. So this number is highly accurate, well over 70%. And again, it is formed by the options market. You guys are going to see a theme of some of these lines and numbers coming from the options market because it's the most predictive market in the world as far as the information it gives. Okay, so for the sake of this video, we are going to start fresh. So I'm going to take 6.32 and I'm going to add it on top and bottom of 523.12. All right, so now we have our expected range. And for those that don't have a broker that provides this data, all you have to do is type in options, AI, spy, expected range. And what will come up is, let me move this over. What will come up is this right here, options, AI, free tools. And it will tell you the expected range by a certain date here on this. They don't have everything. And I'm pretty sure you have to pay for a bunch of other stuff, not sponsored, uh, but this is an alternative for some stocks. It doesn't do it for everything. Now, the second step I always do in my charting system, after I get the expected range down first, I always chart this blue line, the market maker hedge range, because it gives us two pieces of information. Number one, it's a level in itself. So this will act as a supply zone and this will act as a support zone if the expected range is broken, which again has over a 70% chance of not breaking. But it also tells us if the market maker hedge range is closer to the expected range on one side than the other, dramatically closer, like this would be, it can tell us how the market makers might react to supply zones or support zones. Let me explain here. If the market makers are hedging closer to where they expect the stock to go, then wouldn't you think there would be more urgency to reject it, right? Because they're kind of in trouble here, right? If they're hedging closer to the expected range, they have a lot more to worry about than if they have a wider range that they're hedged in. So this, whichever side the market maker hedge range is closer to by a dramatic margin, you can expect more violent reactions for that side's direction. So for example, if this was really close and this was really far from the expected range, then we can expect that the dip buys are going to be more aggressively bought up off the support zones 
rather than the sell-offs. Additionally, for the side that has the bigger gap, you can expect towards that upper end of the range that you can expect it to resolve in choppiness. Why? Because they have a lot more leeway. They're going to let price do its thing and chop around. They're not going to step in as fast. So just this one level not only gives us a little intel as to maybe the behavior of the market going forward, but also gives us two levels in case that the expected range does break. Of course, the golden question is, how do we get this number? Well, I use Robinhood. Your broker, again, might have this information, or your brokerage, but it might not, so you might have to look up a YouTube video. But I use Robinhood because it easily displays this data. It's also on Thinkorswim, I know that. But what you wanna do here, I'm gonna show you guys a recording here. What you wanna do is you wanna to go to the same expiration that you drew your expected range. So for this, it'd be April 5th. And what I'm going to do is see the top buttons where it says buy or sell. I want to show the chance of profit. And under Robinhood, it's, it's chance of profit is under sell, the sell tab. So under that, you want to scroll up for calls. You want to scroll up until you see a 90% chance of profit. That level right there is going to be your market maker hedge range. That is where the market makers are hedged to. Now, you'll see it's slightly over 90%. So what I like to do is I like to take the one strike, 90%, and the one under it that's just under 90%. So in this case, it's 88.1, and you're going to split the difference of the strikes. So right here, 532 and 531, the middle is 531.50. So we would go to our chart and put 531.50 as the market maker hedge range. Likewise with puts, you want to scroll down until you see 90% to the downside. And this right here, it's between 513 and 514. So that gives us 513.50. Again, 90% chance of profit. So if we do that, we get something like this. What you'll notice is the gap between expected ranges is slightly bigger on the downside than the upside, but it's not so dramatic that we're like, oh, okay, this is clearly going to be sharper rejections off of the upside. You know, if it was something like this. Now, what if I told you that in the market, there are invisible resistance and support levels that are not on price action charts that greatly influence where and how price moves? This is called call walls and put walls. These levels you will never find on a price chart and similar to some of this other stuff, you can only find it within the options market. Let me explain. Let's say you have a stock and you're trading it long and you didn't know about a call wall. You would have never known it was a huge resistance level or the fact that if you are above it, that the bias is to close under it, which I'll show you here in a second. Why is that? Because a call wall and a put wall is just an area of high open interest for options. So there's an imbalance. There's a huge level of calls here. And when you're thinking about that magic word market makers, right? That's a scary word. Everyone's like, oh, what do they do? Well, their job is to balance the market. And when they push this above, they're not balancing the market above this high open interest area. So the incentive is to close it under because why pay the largest area of calls? Why do that? it's not logical and it doesn't work out most of the time for them. So they're going to use it as a resistance area. So if we can find these levels, we can know without even looking at price action where some resistance and support levels are, as well as if we are already over them, we could maybe develop a bias of closing under them by an expiration date or over them in the case of a put wall. So how do we find this data? Well, I like to use a variety of different ways. I'm gonna show you a free way here in a second, as always. Uh, but this is a paid tool, not sponsored by them, but I think they display the data pretty cleanly and efficiently for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go look at open interest. And this is SPY, and it shows the open interest for a specific expiration date. We've been talking about April 5th, right? But I'm going to just do the next monthly expiration because that's where most of the money is going to be with the options. So I'm going to choose 419, and I'm going to look for the highest areas of open interest within our expected range, right? Again, we don't really care outside of our expected range. If we have a well over 70% chance of closing within, then we might as well just keep our attention focused between here. So between, what is the bottom range? Around 516 and 530. So between 516 and 530, are there any major levels? Well, certainly at 530, that's a level, as well as 525. You'll notice there's call walls under here, but since we're over them, I'm not really going to consider them right now, especially since they have an equal amount of puts here. So I'm going to go to my chart and I'm going to say 525 and 530. Now, what you'll notice is 530 is already a resistance level. It's that expected range. So we can mark that or we could not. I'm just going to leave it off for now. But 525 is going to be my resistance level. 
And if you're wondering how I put this on my chart, I just simply use an indicator that we give you if you're a part of the group um, and I can just customize this to whatever I want. Now, the alternative free way is just to go to optionistics.com, open up the options chains or literally just go to your broker, guys. You, this is where you guys buy puts and calls. This should look familiar to many of you, at least all of you. Uh, and this is where you buy your puts and calls. You want to scroll down to 419 and go to the highest levels of open interest here for each strike. And those are your levels. They have to be, you know, dramatically more. So 31,000 is double 16. So this is obviously going to be the level, not the 16,000. So this is how you can do it for free. There's a lot of kind of issues with this um, that the other data displays more clearly, but this is the alternative. And if you're really skeptical of the power of this, I had this chart that I charted a week ago, a week in advance with this call wall level. And I mentioned specifically to the upside, the expected range sits above this 524 call wall, which has a bias to close under by Thursday's close. I know this stuff a week in advance because I understand this level. I understand these concepts. I found a call wall and I had a bias. A week in advance, I predicted that the markets would close underneath this level. That is the beauty of this stuff, guys. It is incredible. It makes you look like a genie or a wizard because of how good your levels are. All right, and the next step, the fourth step, is going to be just charting supply in support zones, right? We mentioned this in the last episode. If you didn't watch that, definitely go watch that. You're already behind. But what I'm going to do straight off the bat, since I do have a call wall, is I'm going to mark this as a resistance level. Call walls will always be a resistance level. So we're going to do this. That's going to be a resistance level. And then we're also going to do, I like to do this. This is pretty easy. You just go up to the expected range and you draw a resistance level here. Because if it has a 70% accuracy of closing between, it's definitely going to be somewhat of an area of interest in a supply zone for the future. And then we're going to make this a support zone. Now you'll also see, if you guys watched the last video, you'll notice that these expected ranges are placed very intelligently. The market makers know what they're doing, man. Uh, and if we go down to a smaller time frame, you'll see this. Remember the liquidity grab formation that we talked about in the last video? A chop and a pump, the liquidity sits right on top. Guess what? The expected range sits right there. So that is going to be your liquidity level. But most of the time, the expected ranges are smart enough to already pick that out for you. So I'm just gonna go with the default zones right now. After I get the basics out of the way, what I like to do is I like to go in and see, is there anything in between this large gap that I missed? I'm gonna go down to smaller time frames, maybe hit the five minute and I'm gonna see, okay, yeah, there was a chop and then a massive pump. And again, we know this to be liquidity whenever you see that. So based off of this, I'm going to draw some sort of zone right here. Now moving on to the last part of my charting system before we get into the rules and examples. We need to draw the golden zone. What is the golden zone and why is it so powerful? Well, so many people on YouTube want to just tell you, the, these gurus, all these guys, they just want to tell you, you know, trade off your zones, trade off your zones. But that's just, that's not profitable. Trading off your zones does work in some market environments. But doing that all the time is not going to work well because price action breaks zones. We know that to be true. When does it break zones? When can we expect the big move to happen? Well, it's going to be when you are able to spot the golden zone. In this case, the golden zone was crossed on XLU and I was able to trade the breakout. I was able to time a massive move because of the golden zone being crossed. This is the power of the golden zone. It is essentially the place where liquidity is most attracted to and where there is a pivot level in quotation marks. The pivot level is where the stock has one of two options, down or up. There's no real chop. There's no real, you know, sit there and have a relaxing day. The golden zone is where it's forced to make a move, either stand its ground or break through. This is definitely the hardest part about my system is finding this golden zone. I find it pretty easy now, but for you guys, if you were going to follow along, this is going to be one of the hardest. How I prioritize these, majority of the times, I like drawing diagonal levels. If it can be a diagonal one, it's often better. Again, this goes back to our previous video. If you haven't watched that, go watch it. But diagonal levels are more influential if you can find them than horizontal ones because of how the algorithms trade. And you can see here, we crossed under. Now, first, we have to talk kind of about how to draw it, and then we'll talk about kind of the rules of the golden zone. And a big hint is that it's 90% of the time going to be right in the middle, somewhere within the middle of this range, between the expected range. Now, I just sat off camera a little bit, and I was thinking, where could I see this stock pivot, the SPY? 
and I think I found the level. Do you guys notice right here, you had a high, high, and then another high, you rejected, then you came back up, and then you kind of did this little chop here. Boom, an explosion up. So clearly, there is a diagonal liquidity level here. That is why you chopped off of that zone. So this right here is going to be my golden pivot. Now we can maybe draw this a little better here, try to get it more to touch each one of these. This is going to be my golden pivot level. So what are the rules with this zone? Well, any gap under this typically leads to a bigger expansion to the downside. And likewise, if we gap up off of it, it often leads to a big expansion to the upside. So I really want to see the gap. Additionally, if you come down and you chop at the zone, it's likely to break through and expand. But the biggest idea is this level will help the stock expand because it's where it's like make or break. It's like, hey, you got to do something. You can't do chop you can't just sit there and do nothing it's essentially the level think about it like this that there's three directions in the stock market there's down there's up and then there's sideways this zone helps to eliminate the sideways action and what it does is it creates a 50 50 rather than a one in three that's essentially the concept now that's not actually true but that is the concept of what we're doing here is trying to eliminate the possibilities so that we have better ideas and better trades that are timed better with the markets now, before we move on to actually practicing charting the system on, uh, you know, individual stock as well as, you know, a different index, I need to get some housekeeping items out of the way. Number one, the expected range is always going to be changing. Based off the moves of the stock, it always changes. So which number do we trust and should we update it all the time? No, I chart on the weekends. Every weekend I chart, so I use those numbers. Those are the numbers I use and I keep them there all week long or all month long determining when I draw them. If you draw them throughout the week, the big movements can change and you're going to be wanting to change it all the time. So keep expected the range the same from the day you draw, typically and preferably on the weekend. But if not, that's also fine. Just keep that level the same. It will always be an important level. With that being said, market maker hedge range as well. I do not draw this on every stock. I only do it on the major indices such as SPY, QQQ, Dow, because number one, the liquidity is the greatest with those and the market maker hedge range actually shows a lot of other stocks like XLP, they do not show the market maker hedge range um, for that indice because it is so illiquid. <clears throat> so to save time as well, I do not draw this on individual stock names. Uh, but with that being said, let's go in practice. So first we're going to do an indice real quick and then we'll do an individual name. So for XLP, I'm going to go to my thinkorswim and we're going to get the expected range down. So I'm going to type in XLP. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to go to the options and I'm going to go for April 5th. And you'll see it says 1.14 or 1.147. So I'm just going to say 1.15. So you take 76 plus 1.15, which comes out to 48. And so that's 748 right up here. So now that we have expected range, traditionally on the major index indices such as SPY, QQQ, Dow, you would go for the market maker hedge range. I'm not going to do that uh, just because XLP is less liquid. So we're going to move on now to the call walls and drawing zones. Next is pretty simple. Let's go find our call wall. We're just going to type in XLP and I'm going to go here. I'm going to go for 45 or 419 to find the most money. And you can see that there's two levels, but both of them are heavily weighted to kind of balance, right? Lots of calls, lots of puts, lots of calls, lots of puts. So this is going to be kind of irrelevant for us. So with that being said, I'm going to go and I'm going to go draw my liquidity levels between the expected ranges. First, I'm going to start with the bottom and top of the expected range, because of course they try to place this as intelligently as possible. And these 90% of the time are going to be liquidity levels. And we can see that evident on a smaller time frame. You can see we came down and tagged that zone and pumped off. So this is clearly a liquidity level. You can see, yeah, pump, chop, big pump off of it the liquidity sits right on the chop. You should have known that from the last installment of this series. So we go support here, then we go resistance here, and now we're finding the levels in between. So as far as what you can see between, I notice there's a gap up, there's a chop, and then there's a pump, and then there's another gap up. So somewhere within probably this is going to be a liquidity level. And to the upside, let's go find that real quick as well. You can see right here, perfect. So there's a gap, Right off of this, the liquidity still sits here. Additionally, you could do this level all the way down here as a level. So let's see which one matches. I personally like this level a little more. So I'm going to make this a level and leave that to the upside. 
Now that we have that, we need to draw our golden zone. So what I'm gonna look for first is the diagonal channel, which I know XLP is in. This is going to be the core focus of this. And I'm gonna see if I can find a level based off of that. Again, I'm gonna try to get as many touches on top and bottom as possible. I wanna make sure that I throw on the midline. And what you'll notice is I'm gonna try to line everything up so it fits to the price action. It seems right here is going to fit. You can see lots of chops on that. You can see lots of gaps into it, expansions through. So it looks like this middle line is a very important level. And I'm going to bet that this is going to be the golden pivot for this week. So I'm going to remove the midline on that. And we are going to keep that as the golden pivot. Now, it's important to note, why is this one diagonal, but the others aren't? You can make these diagonals, that same channel that we drew kind of that uh, middle line of the golden channel. You can make the top your resistance and your support as well. So you can make these levels diagonal. Now, I would prefer this, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm keeping them horizontal for now. But you, you want to always prioritize your diagonal levels for support and resistance Again, that goes back to that concept of the diagonal levels are more reliable because of how the algorithms trade. So you would delete something like this and these would be your levels. But for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna keep these horizontal. They both work, but preferably most of the time you always want to prioritize diagonal levels. A great example of this I can show you is XLRE. This is one that we charted. I kept the top and bottom horizontal ones, but the middle was a channel and so therefore I drew these levels diagonally. You can see again the golden zone allowing that expansion to happen uh, and that's what you want to prefer most of the time. Next installment of the series is going to be strictly charting examples. If we look at names like Square here, all you have to do is do the same exact thing. Now I know a lot of you are going to ask what time frame I chart on, mostly the one hour. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go and I'm going to find my expected range for Square. So again, let's say we want to find out for April 12th. I'm going to go to square. I'm going to go to April 12th. We're going to not do the 5th. We're going to do the 12th. And you can see it says 6.22. So basically 6.23. Then we can go and place our zones. Now, what's particularly interesting about this one, and I'll tell you this, is I'm currently long square. I have calls for April 19th as well as May because I believe it's going to break out. It has a beautiful accumulation phase, right? You have the spring down, you have the accumulation. So in this case, does expected range still matter if you're expecting to break out, right? If you break out, it's likely to break expectations. So how do we deal with that? Well, number one, we're still gonna draw our levels and you can see right here that there is this big kind of level that's swooping across here that's been keeping square down forever. So you can see that the expected range is calculating that. They say, yes, we think that this is the most important level, like I do. And so they're anticipating this to be the top. This is the resistance level. If you break this, you're breaking out. So this is where they have it. Likewise, to the downside, they have a support zone down here. So how I like to do this is number one, if you do see this come into this top, you guys should know this from the last video, this is a liquidity grab. This is a liquidity grab. So the top portion of this is actually a good entry long rather than short. It is to bet against the liquidity grabs. And so in this case, when you have an example of, hey, you know, this expected range says this, but I want it to break out. I think it's going to break out. Well, in that case, you're going to draw a momentum zone. So you'll see this on my XLU chart. But I like to draw a momentum zone from the top of where you failed to the top of the breakout zone. And this is the area where you're either going to add or not touch it. This is where you're going to either be in the trade or you're not in the trade or add to it or uh, to your existing position. But if you're not in it by this time, then you need to not touch it because things will get crazy. Things will get volatile, but this is the momentum zone. And we can see this in play on XLU, very similar setup. I would, I believe that XLU were, was going to break out. And right here you have kind of that breakout point. This was where the expected range, similar to square thought that the top of the breakout was going to have to happen. It was the resistance level. But I drew a momentum zone because I know that's a liquidity grab. So I drew a momentum zone from basically that liquidity grab and I said, this is where the stock is going to go bananas and I need to be in the trade by then or not touch it at all or add to my existing position. And in this case, I longed after we gapped above the golden zone, which is the pivot. It's saying, hey, you got over this zone, now we can expand. 
Uh, and so it started to expand. I was in it and I didn't touch it and it broke the expected range. So I like to draw these momentum zones most commonly on stocks that are about to break out or most commonly on stocks that are at like all time highs where if they continue higher, it's just going to be all momentum based. So this momentum zone is really helpful to me. Or is your golden zone for square? Where would that be? Well, personally, because you've rejected here and you've created that lower high, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the diagonal zone actually this level right here. This is where square has to break. If it does, there's nothing much here to stop it. And it will then enter into your momentum zone and hopefully get the strength it needs. But if it does come up here and fail one more time, it's likely to get absolutely demolished. So we have to keep an eye on that as well. Now, one thing we also have to do is our put and call walls, right? So I've already pulled this up for 419. You can see they say a call wall is at 85 and 90. So if we go look at our chart, 90 is already our resistance level. You can choose to add it if you want at 90. Um, but also they say 85, which coincidentally is our golden zone here. So they have to choose whether to break that. And if they're going to break it by April 19th is the question. And although there is a bias to close under this by April 19th, there's certainly some wiggle room for the market makers. They could be already buying and hedging those calls down here, ready for the breakout. So there's a variety of different things, but most of the time, again, these are going to be resistance levels. So we treat them as such. That is my charting system. Hopefully you guys get value from that. Again, the rate report shows all of these charts. So if you're questioning, you know, how good I am at charting, what are my game plans with that? They're all on the rate report. Additionally, we do have a trade group. It is only invite only. So if you want to apply to that, uh, just hit me in the DMS on Instagram and I will get you an application. It's a professional community, a lot of really talented people in there, including my mentors. But the next installment of this series is going to be strictly charting practice. I need to drill these concepts into your head. There's always exceptions. There's always but moments that I need to show you. And the only way I'm going to be able to show you is if you come into that charting video and you just watch me do it. So with that being said, guys, have a great Easter weekend. I'm filming this before Easter. So enjoy time with your family, friends, drink lots of water and don't eat too many chocolate eggs. Also, you guys need to hide them better. I'm seeing too many people. Too many families given the easy peasy eggs in the yard, you know, get those spots hidden, put them in, you know, the lamp, put them right in, you know, even dig a hole and bury them under the ground, right? <laughs> no, I'm not playing with that, but hide them better. That's my challenge. I'm going to hide mine from my little cousins extremely well. They're going to have to work for those calories. <laughs> Peace guys. I never switch sides. Like even when I die, I'm a ride for the squad, let her ties in the hearse. I've been on a vibe kind of hard to describe. I'm in between. I'm good.